Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. And in just a moment, we'll be reading in verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15. I wonder if you ever think about putting God to the test. I wonder if you ever think about testing God. It's something that any of us can do. And uh, do you ever put Jesus to the test? Let's look at this in Matthew 22, very famous text of Scripture, beginning at verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap, ensnare him, Jesus, in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and you defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness, their malice, and said, why, here's the question, we're studying the questions of Jesus, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. You know, I don't understand really how they just kept on coming back for more and more punishment. But these Pharisees and their scribes, they seemed to think that somehow, some way, they were wiser than Jesus, and one of these days, they would pull something on him that would make him really look bad. They would put Jesus to the test, and Jesus said, why are you putting me to the test? I want to ask you tonight, do you ever put Jesus to the test? Let's notice a few things. First of all, the deception of man, the deception of man. Look at verse 15, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him, underline that word, trap him, trap him in what he said. Can you imagine living that way that what you wake up for is to trap somebody? So filled with hatred, so filled with malice towards someone that you want to plot against them and catch them in some controversial trap. What a waste of time. What a waste of life. They plotted together. They conspired. They privately counseled, laying out plans to convict Jesus of a crime. They wanted to trap Jesus in what he said. I love what the King James says here. They wanted to entangle him in his talk. They wanted to catch him up in his words. They wanted to trip him up. These religious leaders hated Jesus, and they thought that their end justified their means. And so, notice verse 16, they were too much of a coward to do it themselves, so they sent their disciples to him. They didn't go themselves. That's the way people do, by the way. They don't do their own dirty work most of the time. They send somebody else to do it, along with the Herodians. And note what they said. Teacher, verse 16, we know that you're truthful, Oh, you teach the Word of God in truth. This is gold-plated, deceptive blarney. Do you know what blarney is? Kind of sounds like baloney, doesn't it? Well, it's the same thing. This is just deceptive flattery. We know that you're truthful. You teach the way of God in truth. You defer to no one. You're not partial to any. They're trying to set Jesus up. They're like 
the scoundrels that the psalmist wrote about in Psalm 5, verse 9. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. They were trying to trick and trap Jesus. Then they laid out the question they thought was indefensible. Verse 17, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? They said, okay, if he says no, then the Roman officials are going to come after him and arrest him for not being loyal to Rome. If he says yes, all of his Jewish followers hate this poll tax and they won't, many of them won't follow him anymore. We've got him either way you go. How many of you know that you never get Jesus? Anybody? You don't ever get Jesus in a trap. Oh, they had him. If he says, no, you shouldn't pay that tax, then we'll get them. Rome will be mad. If they say, yes, you should pay the tax, then the Jews will be mad. We've got him either way. The deception of man. I I want to say this to you as politely as I can, but we live in a day when our secular media so many times tries to trap people. They try to trap people. They don't try to interview people. They try to trap people. And if you've ever been involved in this, it is really something else. Uh, A few years ago, we were discussing downtown, should companies that don't want to do business with people who are openly in their companies professing homosexuality and all these things, is a company, does a company have the right, like these bakers and other people, do they have the right to say no? And, and, and so there was a lot of talk about that with City Hall, and I got involved in all that. And I can remember one day a young journalist from one of the local TV outlets here in, in Memphis came up to me and I was just walking out of the room. I, I was trying to mind my own business. I already been in the meeting. We'd had our discussion. And as I was walking out, she came up, and these lights came on. I felt like a deer in the headlights. And she said, and she stuck this microphone in my mouth, uh, right up to my mouth. She said, don't you think homosexuals should have rights? Well, I tried to be calm, and I asked her a question. Isn't that what you're supposed to do when somebody asks you a question? Ask them a better question. And I said, don't you think heterosexuals ought to have rights? She said, I asked you first. I said, I ask you what I think is a better question. Because there are more heterosexuals than there are people who practice homosexuality. I'm not against the homosexuals. I just don't think that we should be forced to okay their lifestyle. I, I think that we ought to have the right to believe that what we say is scriptural, and I don't think that we should be. Don't you think we should have those rights? She cut the camera off, and she went somewhere else. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm Mr. All-Wise, but I know one thing. If you will lovingly, politely, yet firmly ask somebody a question, when they give you a, a quick question like that, it's usually the better part of wisdom. But you see so much in our left-wing media nowadays, they sensationalize, they criticize Jesus' followers in every way possible. It happens nonstop in our mainstream media. There's so much deception. Why is that? I want to tell you why I believe it is. The devil knows that Jesus is coming back. And I believe that we need to be looking for Jesus. I, I wish he'd come pretty soon, don't you? I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, I, I wish he'd come on back. If he wants to come back before I go on vacation, praise the living God. I'll, that'll be the best vacation I ever took, all right? I just want to say this to you. I believe that when you see the work of the devil increasing, you know God is either about to move or the Lord's about to come back. There, there's always a correlation there. So that's the deception of man. The devil, the great deceiver, uses the hearts of sinful men to deceive, the deception of man. Notice then, contrast that with the second point, the 
the deception of man, but the perception of Jesus. Jesus never wavered. Jesus was never taken off guard. Look at verse 19. These disciples of these hypocritical Jewish religious leaders, they thought they had asked Jesus the question that would take him down, how wrong they were. Look at verse 19. Jesus just looks back and said, uh, show me the coin used for the poll tax. Don't you know that blew their mind? Now, what's he up to this time? So they brought him a denarius. He knew their hypocrisy. He knew their conniving ways. He knew they were trying to set a trap for him. But he didn't worry about it. He knew he was not going to fall for their trap. He understood what the Scripture says in Proverbs 28, verse 10. You ought to know that verse. Proverbs 28, verse 10. He who leads the upright astray in an evil way will himself fall into his own pit, but the blameless will inherit good. Jesus was not being led into a trap. Jesus was leading them into a trap. Don't mess with Jesus. That's in the Bible somewhere. Don't mess with Jesus. All right. Look at verse 20. And he said to them, here's this question. Whose likeness and inscription is this? And with this perceptive question, Jesus set himself up for victory, and he set these people up for defeat. He was wiser than them, more perceptive than them. I'm just telling you. Jesus' perception. He is God in the flesh. You don't need to argue with Jesus. We're going to keep going in Matthew 22 in the days ahead. And we'll find that they never did win an argument against Jesus. At the end of the chapter, we're going to read these words in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. Then surrounded by the Pharisees, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? He was always asking questions. They, they replied, he's the son of David. Jesus said, well, well, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the place of honor at my right hands until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could answer him. Don't you like that? No one could answer him. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Jesus was quoting from a famous Messianic text, Psalm 110, verse 1, the most often quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. He asked them a question they couldn't answer, a question about the Messiah, and that made them look theologically ignorant in front of all the crowd, and they were blown away. He did it again. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to answer his question. Jesus is smarter than us, I guess, but we hate to admit it. It's amazing. Those people are still alive today. There's a lot of people that think they're smarter than Jesus. They say, well, I know what his word says, but now I don't need to abide by that. I, I know that the word of God says this. I know that Jesus said that. The fact is, none of us are smarter than the Lord. He is God in the flesh. You don't get any smarter than that. He is God. He knows everything about you. Let me just say this. Don't ever forget this. There is nothing Jesus does not know. There's nothing he does not know. Now, while he was on this earth, yes, he didn't know exactly when the Father was coming, but you know what? He knows it all now. Jesus Christ knows everything about you. Jesus Christ knows you better than you know you. Hey, I'll tell you something, guys. He even knows you better than your wife. Now, that's knowing right there, amen? Jesus knows you. He knows the motives behind everything you think, do, and say. Jesus Christ knows us. You don't challenge somebody like that. You don't challenge an all-knowing, all-seeing, omniscient, perceptive God like Jesus in the flesh. I love what the psalmist said about God knowing everything. Psalm 139, O Lord. You've searched me. You've known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path 
and my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed down in Sheol, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you. I am fearfully, I am wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was yet made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all written. The days that were ordained for me. Think about that. God has already ordained how long you're going to live. When as yet there was not one of them, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. I would say that you wouldn't mess with somebody like that. You wouldn't try to outsmart them. I love what Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God said, my thoughts are not what? Not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jesus knows your every thought. He knows what's behind it. Jesus is smarter than you are. Jesus could score better on the ACT than you can. Jesus has a higher IQ than you do. Don't mess with him. Don't argue with him. When he tells you to do something, if he tells you don't do this, Dr. Rogers said if he says don't do something, he's saying don't hurt yourself. If he says do something, he's saying help yourself. Don't argue with Jesus. Whatever he says, just do it. Just do it. The perception of Jesus. Well, notice then finally, not just the deception of man, the perception of Jesus, but the correction of Jesus. Look at verse 20. Now, some of you may not like this because you don't like paying taxes. Not an amen in the bunch. Look at verse 20. He said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Jesus was pulling over on them, if you will, what they were trying to pull over on him. He was giving them an indefensible question. If they didn't acknowledge who was on that coin, they would be seen as not being loyal to Rome. Or they, worse, they'd be ignorant, be like they didn't know who was on the coin. So they fell into the trap. They said, that's Caesar likeness, that's his likeness, that's his inscription, that's Caesar's. And with that, they ensnared themselves. They had set a net for Jesus, and they walked into it, and whoosh, they were up in the net. Then he said to them, then render. If that's, if that, if that's Caesar's inscription on that, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But he didn't stop there, did he? And to God, the things that belong to God. He answered the question. Basically, it is right. It is right to pay what you owe to the government. And it is also right to pay what you owe to God. It's not either or it's a both and. You owe money, you owe taxes, pay them. Is that not what the Scripture says? Is that not what Paul said in Corinthians? Pay your taxes, do what you're supposed to do, honor the king, pray for the political rulers. They are messengers from God, the Bible says in Romans. Pay your taxes, but also give God what he deserves. And he's not talking so much about money there. He's talking about loyalty. He's talking about surrendering to him. And he's also in the context talking about you need to render to the Messiah what's due him. 
You need to follow me is what you need to do. You need to quit spurning me. You need to quit trying to trap me. And you need to let me come into your life to change your life. You need to pay God what you owe him. And you owe him your life. Jesus said, I'm about to die for you. I'm about to rise from the dead. You owe me everything. So pay up. Pay up. Render to God the things that are God's. And by the way, he was saying, I am God in the flesh. So you owe me. And hearing this, they were amazed. They marveled. And leaving him, they went their way. They thought they had him, but they didn't. The correction of Jesus. You know, God still corrects his children. I know that some parents nowadays don't believe in that. But Proverbs twenty two fifteen 15 is still in the Bible. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. How many of you believe that? Does anybody believe that? Raise your hand. It's in the Bible. You know you're supposed to believe that. He said, no, no, no. It's not my little baby. Yes, your baby and you too. Foolishness is bound up in our hearts. Why? Because sin's in our heart. And what gets it out? The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. It's not a head issue when a child disobeys the parent. It is a heart issue. And it's part of our spiritual DNA. We have a foolish, sinful, sin nature that we get at conception And then we act on it by choice when we're old enough. And the Bible says only the rod can get that out. Spanking, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Dare we even say it anymore. God corrects his children when we sin. I want to ask you a question. And before I ask the question, I'll say this. This only happens to real Christians. So that ought to tell you right there that if you're a real Christian, you ought to answer your question. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. How many of you, God, has ever spanked you for something you did wrong? Anybody? I got both hands up. Rejoice! Because he only does that to make you more like him. Jesus corrects us. The correction of Jesus Hebrews 12, 10 says, for our earthly fathers discipline us for a few years. I can remember when my daddy was spanking me, it felt like a few years. I didn't think he'd ever stop. My dad told me, he said, if I take the belt off, something's going to happen. I'm not putting it back on until it touches you rapidly, steadily. I'm aiming for your backside. If you jump, I can't help what I hit. Now, if that bothers you, I couldn't care less because I know that he loved me and he did what was right. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. That's why God disciplines you. That's why he spanks you when you do wrong because he wants you to be holy like Jesus. If you go astray, God will correct you. And I pray that you will receive his correction as something loving from a heavenly father. Now, let me go back very quickly as I conclude here just to the question that Jesus asked back in verse 18. Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Why are you testing me? Why are you putting Jesus to the test? Did you ever read that in the Bible? Sure you did. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness? How many of you remember that? It's Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and we read about it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. One of the temptations, the devil took him into the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, here's the devil quoting scripture, he will command his angels concerning you, that's Psalm 91, and on their hands they will bear you up and that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, You shall not do what? Put the Lord your God to the test. I believe with all of my heart 
that when Jesus in Matthew 22 looked at those guys and said, why are you putting me to the test? It was just one more way of saying, I am God in the flesh. You're not supposed to put God to the test. When you put Jesus to the test, you put God to the test. Don't put Jesus to the test. How do you do that? When he tells you to do something, just obey him. If he tells you to give some money to somebody, just go on and give it to him. Look, it's not your money anyway. He just loaned it to you. If Jesus tells you to witness to somebody, go witness to them. If Jesus tells you to help somebody, go help them. If Jesus says pray for somebody, go pray with them. If Jesus tells you to do something that will inconvenience you, who cares? You've already died. It does, you know, dead people can't get their, their feelings hurt, right? Jesus owns you, amen? So God tells you to do something, you just go do it. And if you don't, what are you doing? You're testing Jesus. When you don't obey him, you're testing him. Have you never said to your children, don't test me? Don't test me. Don't put me to the test. You need to obey. Believe it or not, that's what God is saying. So whatever he tells you to do, what did Mary say? Do it. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, you just do it. Don't go through life testing the Lord. I'll tell you, I know it is the will of God for you to wake up tomorrow morning to read his word and to pray. You know why? He tells you to do it in the Bible. Don't test the Lord. I know that it is the will of God for you to be kind to people. You know why? It's part of the fruit of the spirits in the Bible. It's in Galatians 5. Don't test the Lord. I know that it's right for you to be kind and it's right for you guys to love your wives like Christ loved the church. We're to love them like we love our own bodies, to love them like we love ourselves, to live with them in an understanding way as a weaker vessel since they're women and grant them honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that our prayers won't be hindered. We know that we're supposed to love our wives, take care of them. Why? It's in the Bible. And when you don't do it, God's saying, don't test me. Don't test me on that. Don't be argue, argumentative all the time with your spouse. Don't be ugly to your spouse. Be kind to your spouse. I gave her to you to keep, to keep as, a, as a treasure. I want you to treat her like I would treat the church. I want you to treat your wife the way you want me to treat you. And ladies, I want you to love and respect your husband. I love what Carter said here today. A woman can either blow the candle out of a man or be the wind in his sails. I'm going to quote that. And for a while, I'll probably say Carter said it, and then one of these days I'll just say, you know, I was thinking one day. <laughs> no, I won't do that. I won't do that. I'll give him credit until Jesus comes. If, if the Lord will, you know what? I hope I remember to give him credit, but I will. I'll do my best. Isn't that true? And ladies, when, you don't, when, you don't, when you're not like that, when you blow their candle out, God's saying, don't test me. Don't test me. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is loving. But I want to say this to you, and this last thing I'm going to say to you. Do not test him. You will never win. Amen? All right. Sober word, but it's from the word of God. Let's thank the Lord for speaking to our hearts tonight. Amen? Amen.